Welcome everybody, I am Francesco Mantesini, and this is a joint work with Martin Usman and Daniel Travisman. The topic of this talk is to study the asymptotics for the vast system distance between the occupation measure of a fractional Banyan motion taking values on a d-dimensional torus and the Lebesgue measure. The occupation measure of a Banyan motion, or more generally a stochastic process, can be defined by the identity written here. This is a common tool in model probability. For instance, in the study of local times, many questions regarding the properties of the density of the occupation measure have been addressed. In the study of covering times, the focus is on how much area of the space in which the stochastic process is taking values is covered by it. For instance, if one considers a Brownian motion taking values on a d-dimensional torus, one can ask itself how large should be the time interval so that the support of the occupation measure is epsilon close to every point. In this talk, we will address a slight modification of the latter question with Brownian motion replaced by a fractional Brownian motion. As I was saying, instead of considering the covering time problem, we will consider an optimal transport problem that is studying the asymptotics for the vast time and distance between the occupation measure and the Lebesgue measure is scaled by factor t. The vast time and distance between these two measures is defined by a variational problem that is minimizing over the set of coupling the integral of the distance between two points in the d-dimensional torus with respect to a coupling gamma. Gamma is said to be a coupling between the occupation measure and the rescale back measure if its first marginal is equal to the occupation measure and its second marginal is equal to the rescale back measure. Here, let me point out that I'm rescaling the Lebesgue measure by a factor t since I want that the two measures have the same total mass. And by the definition I gave of the occupation measure, it is not a probability measure, but a total mass equal to t. The motivation for this problem comes from a discrete problem that is a random Euclidean bipartite matching problem. Here, the setting is the following. Consider n IID points uniformly distributed on a d-dimensional torus and associate to them the empirical measure consisting of the sum of their Dirac. Then one wants to study the asymptotics for the vast system and distance between the empirical measure and the Lebesgue measure rescale. There is an easy intuition behind this problem, that is, since we are considering uniformly distributed points, one would expect the points to be heavily distributed, meaning that the typical distance between two points is of order n to the power minus one over d. Unfortunately, this intuition turns out to be false in low dimension. What has been observed is that the asymptotics for the vast system at distance uh, uh, provides three different behavior depending on the dimension. There's a critical dimension where our intuitions um, phase by a factor square root of logarithm of n. And this is due to the fact that we are considering a random problem, thus we must take care of fluctuations. And fluctuation turns out to be more effective the, the lower is the dimension. Indeed, in a subcritical dimension, our intuition uh, fails the excess asymptotics by a factor which is of order square root of logarithm, square root of n. In higher dimension, our intuition turns out to be true. There are many questions that one can ask himself starting from this point. For instance, one can ask himself whether there is existence of the risk of limit. It is still out of a problem to show in the, 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 whether the limits exist or not in the critical dimension too. As a natural question arising from the discrete problem is what happens if I consider a continuous variant of this problem? Meaning that what happens if I consider instead of the empirical problem, the, the empirical measure, the occupation measure. This problem has been addressed by Wang and Su recently, and they consider diffusion processes taking values on compact Riemannian manifold. Thus, they also consider the case of a Brownian motion taking values on a d-dimensional torus. The result, which was stated for W2 distances, but with minor uh, modification of the proof one can get also for W1 distance, is in the same fashion of the previous result for the random bipartite matching problem. There are three different behavior. There's a critical dimension, this time the dimension four is the critical one, where a logarithm term comes out. There is a subcritical dimension and a supercritical dimension again. Let me recall you what's a fractional Brownian motion. So a fractional Brownian motion is a Gaussian process, thus it's efficient to prescribe its uh, mean function and its covariance function. And we define the fractional Brownian motion as the center Gaussian process with covariance function given by this expression. Note that the covariance function of a fractional Brownian motion depends on a parameter h, which varies in 0, 1. 
And if H is equal to one half, then the fraction of Brownian motion is exactly a Brownian motion since the covariance function corresponds to the, to the covariance function of a Brownian motion. Constructing a fraction of Brownian motion on d-dimensional torus is fairly natural. One can consider the independent uh, copies of a fraction of Brownian motion and project them into the d-dimensional torus via the canonical projection. Note that the fraction of Brownian motion for H uh, that differs uh, from one half is not a map of process. What was important for Wang and Zhu was that they were considered diffusion processes that by definition, they are Markovian. But in our case, we don't have Markovian structure in general. That is why our result gives new insight in this field. What we discovered is that if we consider a fraction of Brownian motion, we again find that there are three different behavior depending on the dimension. There is a critical dimension that is the dimension one over h plus two. In low dimension, the dependency of the rate on the boost parameter h is all implicit in the dimension, while in high dimension, it's also explicit in the rate. Moreover, what we can uh, we can assure ourselves that this is consistent with the previous result. Indeed, if one takes h being equal to one half, one recovers exactly the rate of one. Moreover, one can notice that if h goes to infinity, formally one recovers the same rate of the random bipartite matching problem with t playing the same role as n. Moreover, note that this, is a, this theorem is an expectation, but via concentration inequality, the one can lift this result to a pathwise uh, statement. So, moreover, what one can notice is that the less is h, the less regular is the fraction of random motion meaning that the less regular is the fraction of the motion, the more it covers. Here is a simulation on the left-hand side of a Brownian motion on a two-dimensional torus, while on the right-hand side, you can see a simulation of a fraction of Brownian motion on a two-dimensional torus, but this time with full parameter given by 0 0.9. Our proof follows an established route by Caraccio and collaborator, and the first starting point is considering a dual formulation of the vast system and distance. Why considering this? This is because we want to have easier formula for the bounds. The main idea is to solve a Poisson problem with data given by the difference between the two measures and to plug this into the dual formulation. By an integration by part argument, one discovers that is for estimating from above the W1 distance between two measures, it's, it's a thesis to estimate from above the L1 moment of the gradient of the solution of a Poisson problem. Thus, by Cauchy's parts, it's sufficient to estimate the L2 norm of the gradient of the solution to a Poisson problem. For the lower bound, one would like to argue similarly by choosing in the dual formulation a representative, a Lipschitz representative of uh, the Poisson, so the solution to the Poisson problem. But one needs to take into account by losing Lipschitz's argument of also the four moment of the gradient of this solution. This is what I said up to now is formal if one considers smooth densities. The problem is in, in our setting is that we are dealing with occupation measure that might be singular. But there is an easy way out that is moving measure by a regularizing kernel. We can do this by considering the each semigroup, for instance. But when doing this, one needs to take into account how far is the smooth measure from the starting measure. One can bound this from above by a factor that is the square root of the regularizing parameter, while from below, one can appeal to a property of the semi group, that is the contraction property, that basically tells you that the regularized measures are nearer than the starting measure. So if one takes this into account and apply the previous lemma, then one ends, ends up with the same upper and lower rate from upper and lower bound from the previous lemma for our case. But this time with the solution not to the to us, but with the solution to the Poisson problem with smooth measures. From the upper bound, there is also an additional term, which is a corrector, which comes from the front that we are regularizing the starting measures. Now, let me briefly tell you how to get upper bound for the L2 norm of the gradient of the solution. Since we are working on in a torus, it's easy to have a explicit formula 
for the solution to the Poisson problem. Indeed, by Fourier analysis, we can write an explicit formula for our solution, and it turns out that it's sufficient to study the variance of the Fourier mode of the occupation measure. Since we are dealing with Gaussian processes, by explicit formula, we can get exact asymptotics and substituting this into the, seri the Fourier series and comparing the series with the integral, this is the first time that we observe that there is a dependency on the dimension of the problem. Thus yielding different rates depending on the dimension. When one substitutes these rates in the lemma that we had before, one ends up with a minimization problem on the right hand side. Minimizing this problem, one, get, one can choose eps, optimal epsilon to get the optimal upper bounds. Note that here, to be fair, the first and the third um, choices of epsilon are optimal from the optimal, from the optimal minimal problem, while the second one is just a choice that, ma that matches the, uh, the bounds from Wang and Zhu. What I want to point out here is that by these choices of epsilon, one meets the our asymptotics from our theorem, and the driving term is the term of the L2 norm of the gradient. And we have exact asymptotics for this term. What's the philosophy now for the lower bound? For the lower bound, the philosophy is to use some homogeneity problem, uh, homogeneity property for the uh, even moments, in the sense that we would like to have a reverse order inequality of, the, of this type. This is in general false, but we can prove by a little bit of effort, with a little bit of effort, that for epsilon being equal to the previous uh, choices, this is true in, for the fourth moments. Then, if one then one can play a little bit with m in the lower bound. And if one chooses m being uh, proportional, being proportional to the L2 norm of the gradient of the solution of the Poisson problem, one discovers that one can bound from below the vast time and distance in expectation with the L2 norm to the of the solution of the Poisson uh, problem with regularized measures. For this term here, we have exact asymptotic, which for the same choices of epsilon, yields us the same asymptotics for the lower bound, as in our theorem. There are many questions that one can ask himself. So um, the first question that one can ask himself is on the existence of the limits for the rescale limits. Moreover, one can ask himself what happens if one, instead of considering the vast time when distance, consider the vast time p distance. In this case, there's a result by Ledoux which tells you that for any probability measures, you can estimate the bus system P distance by the LP norm of the gradient of the solution of the Poisson problem. Another case which is interesting in itself is the generic case H equal one, which corresponds to starting from a point and going straight line with random velocity. Here I finish my talk and I hope to see you during the Q&A session.